Hey, right. hello again. Another day. Chapter four, the children. It's really starting to get closer and closer to the part of the book that I find the most fascinating, which is the exploration of the people itself. The uh, stuff before that, there's not as much insight into truly different aspects of planet Earth, different aspects of human nature. Um, the beginning of the book's definitely good, lays the groundwork well, but but it's the insights into how truly differently human be human beings can operate than they than we see them operating in civilization that because it's all we see because we're in a bubble we assume that's the only way humans can be um, I'm looking right now at the lead photo of one of the adults with the two children um, that you see behind me and later in the chapter is another one of the photos well, of the drawings of an individual in the tribe um, but um, yeah feeling pretty good today not as good as yesterday I don't know how if the reading will be as top-notch but um, things go well the uh, the book will you know, wake me up and inspire me because it's such so much exciting about it and I hope you're enjoying it too anyway chapter 4 people of the deer the children after his first outpouring Franz became silent speaking only in monosyllables and evading the questions that were constantly occurring to me. Perhaps he was ashamed of his outburst on the first night, as a sober man is ashamed of a drunken episode when he has revealed too much of himself to a stranger. Or perhaps he was engrossed only by the delayed arrival of his brother. Each morning he left the cabin to climb the lookout hill near camp, where he spent the hot hours of the spring days staring over the rotting surface of the ice-covered bay to the southeast. Hans was long overdue. Earlier in the spring, he had made a trip to the south end of New Elton Lake, a hundred miles away, to rescue a winter cache which had been left on a little islet. Now Hans had only a scant few days in which to make his return before the ice passed completely from the bay and the dog travel would be no longer possible. On the third morning of our vigil together, it began to rain, and it rained as it did all things in this land, with overwhelming violence. Franz and I were driven into the leaking cabin. As we sat listening to the sodden drumming of water on the caribou skins of the roof, we were both suddenly, we both suddenly became aware of a new sound that had insulated itself, insinuated itself into the muffled thunder of the rain. I listened tensely until I recognized it as only the murmur of snow water flowing down above the ice of the river. It was a sound I knew, but there was a changed depth to its voice. The murmur seemed to swell, to become resonant. Then, in an instant's time, it was transformed into a heavy-throated roar. The cabin shuddered, as if the tin plates on the table slid and rattled, as if they danced to the erratic rhythm of an earthquake. Heedless of the driving rains, Franz ran outside, and as I followed him, I caught a terrifying glimpse of an immense cake of ice, at least ten feet in thickness, rearing out of the river, not more than twenty paces from our door. The great cake stood briefly on end like a gigantic tombstone. Then it toppled forward, and as it fell, a great geyser of tormented water flung itself high above the shifting ice. The river, so long contained was surging up between the shattered flows, and in a few minutes had climbed the slopes below us and was lifting the debris about the cabin door. I watched the cataclysm through the gray lens of the rain while the rising waters lapped about my feet. The sound that had first given us warning of what was about to happen now moved up the river like the roll of a giant drum. As it passed, the thunderous and violent cacophony came into being as the great cake shattered and moved ponderously down toward the frozen bay. The moment of that movement seemed irresistible. The momentum of that movement seemed irresistible. Yet where the river joined the bay, there was resistance, and on a mighty scale. Along its forward edge, the bay ice took the full onslaught of the river flows and shattered, 
with such pressure that the air above the battleground was filled with a fine dust of fine ice crystals that defied even the down-driving rain. Flow cakes the size of buildings were ground out of existence in mere moments to be instantly replaced by others which drove the stubborn barrier of the bay ice slowly backward from the river mouth. At last, the bay ice could give no more, and the lumbering pans came down the river and were held. Behind them, the water rose so rapidly that it was soon knee-deep in the cabin. While the river was no longer fifteen, but thirty feet in depth, great cakes strayed in the eddies behind the ice dam, and one of them nuzzled the log walls of the cabin, as a bull elephant might try his strength against a standing tree. Franz and I had fled to the ridge, and we were filled with a mounting excitement that gave us no time to worry about the possible loss of the cabin and all our belongings. The dam across the narrow river mouth was steadily enlarging, and it shuddered and rumbled wickedly as a constant succession of new blocks crashed into, the, into its upstream side and were thrown high to reinforce the crest. And then, when it seemed that nothing could save the cabin from the insane river, the dam began to give. Moving as an entity, it slid out over the yet unbroken ice of the bay. Ten thousand tons of obstacles slowly gave way before the power of that unleashed river. The dam dissolved so easily that it gave the impression of a gentle and effortless decomposition, but the measure of its true ferocity appeared when a single cake of ice, the size of a small house, was suddenly flung clear and, like a curling stone, was shot for nearly half a mile across the breaking ice of Windy Bay. Spinning over that black, rotting surface, the great cake came to rest at last against the rocks of a small reef, and there it sat through the succeeding days until the sun at last destroyed it. While it remained, it was a fitting token of the forces which the land contains. Both France and I were so engrossed in the sound and fury of the battle that we did not hear the approaching dogs as they climbed our ridge. Not until the wooden sled had rasped over the gravel and stood behind us, beside us, did we see it. The dogs sat back in their traces, and I guessed that the slim boy who stood beside the leader was Hans. Before I had time to receive more than a brief impression of his shadowed face, two bundles erupted from the sled, and one of these took form as a bounding might of fur-clad child who rushed upon Franz and flung, him, flung itself enthusiastically into his arms. The second bundle detached itself from the nondescript baggage and came over to us with a little more restraint, stopping abruptly as it saw me standing there. This was a boy, thirteen years of age, clad in deerskins. He stood awkwardly beside Franz, and his smile grew until his upper lip curled up over his flattened nose, almost obscuring it from view. His big, even teeth glistened at me, and I stared back at him in complete fascination, for I saw that these were children of the people I had come to find. The little girl in Franz's arms was chattering and squirming, unable to contain her pleasure at seeing the man again. And as for Franz... There were tears in his black eyes. At length he put the child down, and I saw that she was no more than five, and small even for that age. She joined the boy, and for the first time she noticed me. Her exuberance vanished at once, leaving her like a small graven image on a hill. Kuni, Franz said, pointing to her, and Anotilik, pointing to the boy, it was a skimpy introduction, but I had to be content with it for the moment. As we all trooped down the hill to the cabin to assay the damage and clean up the mess, I wondered if Kuni could be Franz's child. The sight of me had made the children shy enough, but on hands my presence placed an intolerable restraint. He had long since withdrawn so far within himself that he could barely suffer even the rare contacts with his brother Franz, with me white and an incomprehensible stranger, Hans's withdrawal was complete. He would speak no words to me at all, but sat alone in the dark corner of his cabin, staring at me as he might have stared at some dangerous denizen of his own bleak land. His skin was dark, much darker than his brother's, and it was stretched too tightly over the narrow, fragile bones of his thin face. 
His eyes were empty things, blank, still depths that shifted from my face no more than the eyes of a trapped fox shift from the face of its approaching nemesis. Hmm. But the shyness of the children was, after all, only the shyness of children. In a little while, they were hustling about the cabin, evidently quite oblivious of me as they traded muted grins with one another. Anna Tealick quickly got a fire going in the wet stove, while Cooney, that minuscule model of a woman, ran to the river's edge, got water, and in a few minutes had a brew of tea ready for all of us. After it was poured into the tin mugs, she made herself comfortable on Franz's knee and proceeded to roll a competent cigarette. Franz gave her a light, and she smoked happily while he crooned to her in a manner of a father talking to his child. And now my curiosity could be contained no longer. Franz, I said, is she yours? Franz nodded slowly, though he did not look up at me. Yes, he replied, and his voice was almost hostile and very different from the friendly voice that he had used to me before. Yes, she's mine. I found her out there in the north, and she's all mine! There was a positiveness, almost a fierceness, at the end, as if he was daring me to argue with his right to this incredible child. Then, surprisingly, and with no further prompting, he began to tell me something of the finding of Kuni and her brother Anatelik, and later I was to hear more details from the Eskimos themselves. Some sixty miles due north of Windy Bay, across the sodden plains and gravel ridges, there is a nest of little lakes huddled close up against the banks of the river we call Kazan, but which is properly Inuit Ku, the river of men. Inuit is the people's own name for their race. Translated, it means simply mankind. The term Eskimo is not used by them, but is a tag applied by the Indians, meaning eaters of raw meat. The waters of the little lakes flow into the Inuit Ku not far from its beginning at Lake Anadai, and for some centuries this little group of lakes and the surrounding little hills have been the center of the inland culture. The people spread up and down Inuit Ku until their camp stood on each lake and river of the rolling land. They called themselves Ihelmuit, which means the other people as distinct from those Eskimos who lived at the coasts and possessed a sea culture. In all the time that the Helma would have known the land and roamed its endless spaces, the little lakes that lie beside the wide Kazan, still can't decide on Kazan or Kazan, Kazan sounds better, exercised a special attraction. So it was natural enough, when the tide was turned against them by powers greater than even those the barons know, when plague and starvation struck their blows against the camps, that as the Hamowit retreated, they should fall back upon this place. By the year 1940, the last of the outlying camps had been broken. These few of the people who survived the dissolution of the inland race returned to live once more, as their ancestors had before them, about Utek, Halo, and Kakumi Lakes under the little hills. That place became the last stronghold held by living men throughout the land, and it was under siege. It was a fortress without walls, with only the impalpable defenses that a fading will to live could raise against the overwhelming weight of the grim siege which had been laid upon it. Hmm. The enemies were many, but foremost in their ranks were famine and disease, and these were both strangers to the land, and so were more frightful than the elemental antagonists that the Helma had long since learned to circumvent. By late autumn of 1946, the remnants of the people were clustered about the bleak shores of the little lakes to stand off the never-ending sallies of these enemies as best they could. Hmm. Really makes me think a lot about cultural collapse and, uh, in some ways, what seems to be happening particularly now in America and the world after uh, COVID and the rise of fascism and the war in Ukraine and everybody wanting things to go back to normal and just desperately crying, trying to cling to the little lakes of, you know, whatever, their money, their possessions, their family. Very sad. Brief break to upload that 15-minute clip to um, the website that I use and...
immediately back to reading. Has the advantage of uh, not creating jarring any jarring effect that I guess you know, as the reader or listener might have. Doesn't change the lighting on my face or my position on the screen. The microphone's still more or less in the same place, and I'm still you know, connected to what I'm reading um, as much as possible. Anyway, back to it. The sadness of stiff hearts and strong hearts in the face of cultural collapse. Among the people at that place, there was the family of Anglialek. And in his tent lived his mother, who was very old, his wife called Iktuk, and his three children, Kuni and Atiluk and Pama. Iktuk was a good mother to her children and a good wife to her husband, though her strength was often drained away by those long coughing spells, which ended only when her bright blood dyed the white fox furs she held against her mouth. Anglialek was a good hunter, yet his efforts were too often brought to nothing. Oh, there's a, there's a, a footnote here right in the text. I'll read it. And it, it actually is the, the previous paragraph at the end of my last reading. Um, During the summer of 1947, 18 Ihamuit men, women, and children died of disease, which was probably diphtheria. Mm. Uh, all right. Brought to nothing, for his old gun could not bring down its game when there was no charge of shot, no powder for its long brass cartridges. As for the old woman, she had outlived 300 younger members of her race, and now she waited, almost impatiently, for the erratic glance of death. Each winter she did not hope to see the spring, and yet each spring she lived to see another winter come. Kuni and Anatilik were but small children, still, though Anatilik was old enough to go with his father on long hunting trips, but so often ended with no more than tales of vanished game with which to fill the bellies of the family. Kuni, at four years of age, was already deeply serious about her duties as a woman of the camp. <laughs> she helped her old grandmother to gather willow twigs for fuel, or else drew water from the lakes or watched the cooking fires when her mother had bled too freely from the mouth and could no longer stand. Mm. Finds uh, The people are clearly isolated from civilization, and it makes me think about the sad stories of children in tribes being made to disrespect and find the communities they grew up in, the tribal communities, native communities, paltry and silly compared to civilization, to the glitz and glamour and wealth of civilization. And so they they don't have much energy for it, or they drift away, and they they join that wealth and power. And that description of Kuni, um, deeply serious about her duties as a woman of the camp, I could imagine if, with great exposure to some some of the glorious seeming, particularly to children, uh, aspects of civilization, she might not nearly have been able to to let it flow in her blood, that passion. Hmm. The igloo of Anglialik stood on the north shore of Utekumanik, meaning Uteks Lake. And here it stood, three other camps. On other lakes, within a few miles of Anglialix, there were eight more igloos, and these completed the short roster of the homes of the surviving people. In the late winter of 1946, Anglialic and his neighbor, Utek, went out together on a hunting trip, for even then the food at the igloos under the little hills had grown scarce. The two men took only one sled, pulled by three dogs, for dog feed was also scarce, and they traveled southward to Franz's cabin. In all that broad sweep of land they saw no deer, nor yet the tracks of any deer, and they were frightened men. By chance, Franz was at home when they arrived, and the two visitors stayed overnight with him. In the morning they departed, carrying with them the few food supplies that Franz had been able to spare from his own scanty stocks. But after they had gone, Franz thought about the things they had told him. In his mind there was a mixed foreboding. 
He knew that the camps of the helmet must be nearly empty of deer meat, for he knew that the, fail, the fall kill had been a meager one. And on his own most recent trips through the Imhelmowit land, he had missed several deer carcasses which he had cached the previous autumn for dog feed. He was aware that this meat must have gone into human bellies. He was also aware that people do not steal unless, de unless death has come close enough to make a mockery of morals. And now I'm thinking about um, how easy it is, it is for fathers and mothers' families to feed their children and... You know the the, the the blind terror of the da the when you really think about it objectively the the tiny tiny chance of with thousands and thousands of schools in the country that any one school might have a shooter like uh, like in Texas recently and how infinitely greater the threat to the beloved children slow starvation and death must be and, and what it must be like for parents and. <laughs> You know, as bad as sh shootings are in America, still in <sighs> first world problems, almost. It's very sad. It's good for context and be humble and uh, the struggle to remember to be grateful, not just to know that you should be grateful, but to actually <sighs> genuinely practice gratitude because it, it takes practice. On this midwinter visit, Utek and Anglialik had told Franz the deer had left the land, and that unless the spring came early, the people too would be gone before the warm suns brought the deer back again. Franz had listened to this prophecy, and in his heart, anger almost, over, almost outweighed pity. It was an anger that he should feel a duty and a responsibility toward these savages, and an anger that they should be so foolishly improvident failing to look to and prepare for a distant future as he, a white man, did. There was anger, too, that they had robbed his caches and so made it more difficult for him to travel around the trap lines on which his livelihood depended. And yet perhaps the thing which angered the young trapper most of all was the insistent feeling that his very presence in the place had helped to bring about the fatal misery of the people. His father and the other traders who had once brought furs from the helmet had shown the people that pursuit of fox pelts was more desirable than pursuit of meat. And so in a few decades, the people had learned to neglect the caches of good meat, which they had been used to making every fall. Instead, they learned to trap the white fox and to trade the pelts for flour, shells, and guns. As far as the helmet could discern, it was a satisfactory change, for they were able to meet their simple needs with much less labor after the traders came. But when trading ceased to pay the high profits always required of it, the great company withdrew its post, and the new way of life that had been taught to the people in their innocence now became death. Men who were once great hunters of the deer had become instead great hunters of the fox. But men cannot eat fox pelts. People could not change their ways again. Surely, they thought, if we, if we trap fox this winter and take the pelt south, we shall find the traitor has returned. No, oh, faith in faith in capitalism and business. Oh, what a fucking tragedy! Makes me think of 1984 and the the horrible descriptions of the capitalists that the party force feeds into its poor and sickly citizens. And there's definitely truth to it. Even it can, even it can be abused to uh, create a fascist, authoritarian, pseudo-socialist state. But when the hunter traveled south, the trading post stood empty and decayed as it had stood for many hungry years. The traders came, stayed briefly while their profits warranted, and then left the land, abandoned it, and though and thought no more of the destruction they had wrought. <sighs> Buyer beware. Friends lived there still, and he could not drive out the hidden knowledge of, his, of the fault. Perhaps it was because of this that when Utek and Anglialik went almost empty-handed back to the little hills, Franz thought of them almost with anger in his heart. Hmm. Last night I looked up the um, seven traits of cognitive dissonance, which is a very, very important 
set of psychological principles to be able to understand what's going on in the world now and to, to not under, to understand that human beings are not fundamentally rational and number one on the list was that that uncomfortable feeling sort of in the pit of your stomach that something you're doing something wrong and that you ignore it seems like uh, Franz is dealing with that the winter months dragged slowly by and there came no more cries for help at last, early in March, Franz traveled northward to the Helmut camps and stayed a day in the igloo of the old Hiqua. Here Franz ate his share of the communal food as he had always eaten it, but that share did not even take the edge off his healthy appetite, and he quickly made his excuses and left the camp. He traveled north to his most distant trap line and once again found that many of his meat caches had been robbed by men. It was mid-March, and Angley Alec had returned from a futile hunt during which he carried no gun, but only a crude bow that served him little better than a toy serves a child. For the men of the Helmut had forgotten how to make cunning bows of horn during the long years when they had no need of bows, and the bright guns and shells were to be had in return for pelts. Angley Alec returned to the tent, bringing with him two ptarmigan, and these winter-starved birds were to be all the food that five people and three dogs would have till the time came when many of them would have no further need of food. For a month before that final hunt of Angley Alex, there had been no more than a mouthful of food for each person on each day, and this hunt had been a last desperate effort to halt the slow attrition of the gut. The hunt had failed, as it was bound to fail, and now the course of things followed an inevitable pattern which the hunter could no longer break no matter how he tried. Death was upon the camp, and all that the people there could do was to channel the approach of death so that the least important of the living might go first. There was no open mention of the problem, for none was needed. While Ang while Alex still lived, there was still hope, but should he, the hunter, die, then the family must perish, even though the deer returned in numbers to the little hills. God, what, what it must be like as a man to feel so important to your family and your community. So many men are just so starved for that. You see so many men just, just adrift. Sometimes I feel like myself, I'm going in that direction. No way to feel incredible can't seem to find your way to feel any feeling any feeling incredibly important to your community <sighs> next to him stood the children Kuni, Pama and Anatilik who were the visible expression of the Helmuts wanting waning will to live not that they don't also want to live Behind the children was Iktuk, wife, mother, and source of new life, yet her work was nearly done, for the children were old enough to live without her aid. Then came the dogs, the precious dogs, the three survivors of a once good team. These three scrawny things were treasures and irreplaceable. Mobility was their potential in the family, and without their power to move across the frozen land, not even a great hunter could survive for long. That was the family, then. Except for the old woman, Epitna. What was her place? Nothing more secure than in the niche, the niche of love and filial affection that could ensure for her, and these emotions die readily enough when hunger closes its inexorable jaws. <sighs> it can be emotionally difficult reading this book sometimes. Hmm. On the night after Angley Alex returned with the two birds, the old woman did not sleep. It was her time. And she had waited for it through too many starving years. She had looked forward with a hard relief to death, and this night her seeking ended in a wall of snow. Yet now that it was time, fear rose in her. The fear that is so strong in the old in which makes the terror of young men in danger look pallid and a sham. Hmm. 
Maybe she should. <laughs> she, she could have read the death of Ivan Ilyich. Hmm. It was not long before the members of her family took refuge from their belly's agony in sleep. But the old woman sat on and stared unseeingly over their quiet forms. She heard the whimpers of little Kuni and the uneasy mutters of the man, her son. But most clearly did she hear the whispers of the sand-like snow as the never-ending winds drove it along the polished curve of the igloo's dome. The harsh rustle filled her hearing until she was no longer conscious of the little human sounds. The snow noise rose in gradual ascension, and as it grew, so grew her fear of death. The long night was nearly over when the skeletal guardians of the passageway, the dogs, lifted gone heads and cowered against the snow blocks to leave the passage free for her and the old woman passed out of the igloo into the darkness. The ground drift of driving snow enveloped her, and the darkness grew around her. She stood naked, but for her fur trousers, and now she loosened these, and they slipped soundlessly into the drifts. The wind whined like a beast in pain, and the darkness... drew about her frail and tortured form. When morning came, no one but the, in the family spoke of her. Not, a, not even the child Kuni made reference to the missing face. But later, later when the brief half-light of day was upon them, Ang Liatlik went out alone into the snow, and he stood facing the wind with his amulet belt round tightly around his waist, and then he spoke the words that he had learned as a child in the great and populous camps of the people. He spoke the phrases that he had been taught to say over the newly dead. That was in mid-March. It was the time when the days grow slightly longer and when the eternal winter winds usually drop and die away for days on end. Yet on this year the winds forgot their place and mounted steadily under the whole, until the whole world that was the barrens, became a single roaring wind without cessation. Had there been the game to hunt, no man could have ventured out to hunt that game. In the igloo of Anglialic, the family huddled under the skin robes upon the sleeping bench and waited. By day, there was a faint, pallid glow to lighten the still gloom of the snow house. By night, there was nothing, for there was no deer fat to burn in the little lamp. The wind rang on the snow walls with such devilish persistence that its voice at last ceased to be heard and became one with the growing silence. The dogs no longer stirred, but lay in tightly curled, half-frozen balls, with noses under tails, sleeping the unconscious sleep of those who near the end of hunger. The two birds were eaten. The children had the balance of their meat, but Angley Alec had a small share. The guts and feathers went to the dogs, and only Iktuk ate nothing. Her husband tried to make her eat his own slim portion, but she turned from him coughing blood and would not eat. A week after the old woman that had left the place, Iktuk could no longer stir except to cough. It was at this time that Anglialik went to the igloo of Utek, who stood on only a few hundred feet away, and he had trouble finding that igloo because the ground drift, the never-ending ground drift, obscured the way like a thick mist. In Utek's igloo, there were the man, his young wife, Halmik, and a child who was still nursing at her dried-up breasts. Utek himself had eaten nothing for twelve days, and the scraps of old robes that had been boiled over the last handful of willow twigs had gone to the two who could not live without each other. This was the third child of Utek, and the first one that had lived a full year's span. Hunger had taken the others in their time, and now Utek was prepared to disregard the law which says that the first that first the hunter must be fed. <laughs>
Angliolic spoke to Utek, and they debated quietly and with long intervals between their words some course of action they might take. They knew Franz was away on a distant trap lines, and they knew that he might not return until to return to his camp for a month or more. And that would be too late. But now Utek remembered hearing of a white man who had recently built a tiny trading post some ten days' journey to the east in order to trade with the coastal Eskimos who sometimes wintered inland from the sea. It seemed to Utek that they should forsake the little hills and make their way eastward, seeking to escape from death. Yet when Anglialik heard this suggestion, she could not agree to it. He knew that he could not join Utek and the rest, for Iktuk could no longer walk, and Anglialik had no dogs with strength to pull the sled. Now, in the, my Kindle here is the drawing that I inserted of, uh, I think it's Utek. Uh, a week later, there were still four igloos on the shores of Utek's lake, but only one of these held human life. The people from the other three had set outward, set out toward the east in a forlorn and nearly hopeless struggle for survival, with the inexorable presence of destruction, destruction close upon their wavering trail. In the remaining igloo, Iktuk wakened suddenly from a long sleep, and she would have screamed in terror at what she saw, but her thin blood ran backward down her throat and choked the scream. The others slept beside her and did not stir, for only Iktuk had glimpsed the devil who had come for her. Struggling terribly, she gained a brief control of her choking lungs, and in a wild paroxysm she forced the life-giving fluid from her chest. The hemorrhage flowed heavily from her gasping mouth, dripped over the edge of the sleeping ledge, fell, and froze instantly upon the floor. In the middle of the day, which followed, Anglielic awoke and found his wife's body frozen in a grotesque contortion on the snow below the ledges. Below the ledge. He tried desperately to drag it out of the igloo before the children woke, but he could not bend the legs and arms that had been flung out from the body in the last convulsive efforts of its life. He could not move his wife, and so, for the little time which remained to him, he could look down upon the bloody face of one whom he had loved so greatly that he had dared remain on at this place. Instead of following the faint hope that had taken all the other people to the east... A dog had also died that night... So it was eaten. The children ate the dry and bitter meat of the dog that died of hunger. And Angli allocate just enough to keep his strength in hand for what remained. A week passed and the other dogs were killed before they grew so thin that they became completely useless to the living. March passed into April and at long last the winds retired and in the daytime the sun shone clearly, growing higher in the winter fading sky. The last of the dog meat was eaten, and one morning Anglialic took his old rifle and curled out the old door tunnel into the light of day. The hunter was going hunting once again. Dragging the rifle behind him, he crawled weakly over the ice-hard snow, and he had gone perhaps a hundred yards, his eyes half-blinded by the glare, when he saw a ma movement on the ridge ahead of him. Trembling with weakness and with hope, he raised his ancient gun, steadied it briefly, and fired at the miraculous vision of the caribou that stood watchfully before him. The children, huddled together in the igloo, heard no shot, for none was fired. They ate no meat that day, for there had been no deer. In the white brilliance of that day, the thing that was Anglialic grew stiff beside the old and useless gun which was still pointed to the unblemished drifts where the hunter had seen the last of all his deer. It was just after dawn on the following day when Franz reached Utek's lake. He made it once for Utek's igloo, but when he found it, its tunnel drifted in with snow, he knew the people had gone elsewhere, perhaps to Halo's lake, and so he prepared to travel south again to his own distant camp. He swung his dogs along the shore, but when one of them raised its head and howled, Franz glanced off to the side and saw a brown, shapeless hummock on the snow. 
At first he thought it was a wolverine, and he slipped his rifle free of its case, but the brown thing did not stir, and when Franz reached it, he recognized the man. Franz feared the dead, for his Indian blood runs strongly through the imagery of his white man's mind. He did not touch the frozen corpse, but turned his dog's back until he came to the igloo of Angliallic. The passageway was open, though there, though only a narrow cleft remained free of drifts. Fearful of what lay under the little dome, Franz called aloud, but got no answer. He would have turned and fled from the place then, but faintly he heard a sound, as of an animal that had been maimed and left for dead. Franz tied his dogs. Then, summoning all his courage, he wormed his way down the long passage that was nearly filled with drifting snow. He came in time to save the younger children. They were both awake and waiting for their father. Now dimly they saw that he returned, and the whimpers of the little girl grew louder. Friends covered Palma's frozen corpse and the horrible body a Vict took with some skins taken from the ledge, and then he stayed a full day in that igloo. He fed the two bony things he had found on soup cooked on his primus stove, and he waited patiently while the two children wretched it up again. Then he once more fed them soup until their rebellious stomachs would accept the nourishment. It reminds me of stories of starved soldiers from prison camps in Vietnam coming back to America and or prisoners in concentration camps in World War II um, being fed, prisoners in, in World War II being fed by the soldiers, the American soldiers who just wanted to help and, and, and the prisoners died trying to eat the food because they were so starved, their stomachs couldn't handle it. And the soldiers via Vietnamese concentration camps coming home and just wanting a hamburger and having to be denied a hamburger <laughs> because the doctors knew it would kill them. Maybe simple soup is, is what you have to start with. Hmm. His, he kept the tiny stove going at full heat until the igloo's dull walls brightened and filmed with ice. As the temperature rose rapidly, the little girl held out her hands to him, trembling little talons that were white with frost, and Franz massaged them gently till some warmth, warmth returned. By the next day, the children were already displaying the incredible resilience of the very young. Franz did not dare linger any longer, for he had no dog feed in his sled, and little enough food for himself. Also there was the presences of Iktuk, Palma, and Anglialik. A hundred miles lay between Franz and Windy Camp, and he was anxious to begin the trek. He unloaded and cached the frozen corpses of the dozen white foxes from his sled, and in their place he spread out his own robes in the two, with the two children carefully wrapped amongst them. Then he drove south from Utex Lake, and in two days was lighting a wood fire in the stove by Windy Bay. Hmm. It's strange and scary and almost nice reading this book. There's some times where I feel so cut off from my real emotions that I, I wonder if, if it's even possible to feel a sense of beauty or to cry again. I know there were times when I was reading movie scenes or audio books. You know, Rilke's letters to a young poet last year before the co-op job sort of broke my spirit for artistic stuff and in particular one when I was reading Captain Coons's monologue in Pulp Fiction where something sort of broke open in me and I really felt the emotion of it and uh, it's it's a uh, it's uh, tragically beautiful to be able to um, connect enough with mere written words on the page to be able to um, fight off tears. And it um, does a lot more to um, help it feel real and human, like which is what I'm trying to do. Um, <laughs> I don't know, there was, there was a moment where I felt 
something in my nose and I almost wondered if I had this image of getting a nosebleed all of a sudden and continuing to read through it and how appropriate that would have been. Hmm. Hans came in from his trap line a short time afterwards, and if he was surprised to find the children at the cabin, he did not show it. In a few days, he found himself left alone with the orphans, for Franz had forgotten his old anger against the people, and he had forgotten his impatience with their improvident ways. The finding of Kuni and Anotilak had wrought a great change in him. I mean, like me reading this book. <laughs> Uh, as soon as he was satisfied that the children would be secure during his absence, he hitched up his dogs again and drove back to the little hills. At Katilu's igloo on the banks of Kakumi Lake, he found starvation had reached the ultimate limits before death intervenes. Friends distributed part of the flour and meat that he had brought with him, then drove on to all the occupied igloos he could find, giving to the family and each enough food to prevent immediate disaster. At Utek Lake and at Halo Lake, there was still no sign of life, and Franz had no knowledge of what had happened to families who had once been there. Now I'm thinking about Franz's anger about their improvident ways and the savages, and you know, it's it's really not that different from the the frightening lengths that people will go to to avoid change, positive change in life. And you could even talk about politicians, Republican politicians letting their souls be devoured by budding fascism and Donald Trump in order to avoid losing their community and their jobs and their change. And people will die horribly rather than change for their lifestyle and their community, even if it's not a beautiful one with genuine love in the hearts of your the members of your community I actually can't remember if I'm, if I'm rereading this or not but um, I think this is where I left off at Utec Lake and Halo Lake there was still no sign of life and France had no knowledge of what had happened to the families who had once been there when the food was distributed, and it was only a miserable handout, though it was all Franz had, he returned at once to Windy Bay, and after one day's rest, drove southward on the 300-mile journey to the nearest outpost of white men. This was a tiny trading post at Deer Lake, run by a young half-breed manager who was himself completely isolated from the world in winter, except that he had an ancient shortwave radio, over which it was sometimes possible to transmit his halting signals in Morse code. Franz reached Deer Lake in seven days, and of those seven he spent three fighting a spring blizzard. Once at the post, he and the manager labored over a message that would tell the outside world of the plight of the Hamlet. It was a message of great importance, for it was to be the first message ever to go out from the inland plains the first cry for help in all the centuries that the people had lived their hidden lives within the land. France was, the, France was the first of those, traders, trappers, or missionaries who had heard of the people and their plight, to take it on himself to seek help for them. He was the first to care. The message went out slowly, each word tapped out two or three times. At Churchill, the big radio station picked it up and relayed it south. The days were passing, and Franz waited at Deer Lake for the answer which was so long delayed. The days were passing. As to what happened to the message, who can say? At first, no doubt, the authorities were skeptical of its validity, and in any case one must investigate before one spends the funds of the government. Also, it was the first time that the authorities had been called on to help the inland people. Why should they need help now, after all these years? But at last, the wheels began to turn. A message was dispatched to the pause. An aircraft was hired and a flight was made. That flight failed. A second flight was made and a plane landed at the extreme south end of New Elton and, unlo and unloaded its supplies. 
Meanwhile, France had been expecting an aircraft from Churchill, the direct and shortest route, and when he heard that someone had sent a plane from the Paz instead, he left Deer Lake to find the cache, which had been made over 200 miles short of its destination. Time was running out. Franz traveled over 100 miles to find the cache, and when he found it, he discovered that it consisted largely of things that would be of no aid to the dying men and women in the camps. There were white beans, sacks of white beans, for people who had no fuel for fires and whose world was still one of snow and ice. Loading his tired dogs with the things that could be used, Franz started north again, 200 miles of bitter driving, with the spring thaws already making progress very difficult. Time had been running out. Franz had traveled almost a thousand miles on behalf of the people. He came to the camps again in time to learn that Epuk, Eljut, and Uktelohik, Ilatutna, Epitna, Okinuk, Okinuk, and Homoguluk, people he all knew well, had not been able to await his coming. Part of me wonders if I should be spelling out those names for you. <coughs> it was spring. These dead ones were buried under rock piles where the snow had left the ridges. <coughs> there were others, too, who did not have the benefit of graves, but whose bodies were attended to by wolves and wolverines, so that their spirits may never know the rest that comes only to those who are buried properly. In the camps where these had died, there had been none left to bury them. France had done much for the Helmwood, and in so doing had done much for himself. The old bitterness and anger, the leg legacy of his own treatment at the hands of the white man, was all gone. No, not quite gone, but turned against those who deserved it, and no longer against the people of the Little Hills. As for the people, it was only another spring for them, no different from two score springs, which had been theirs during the last half century. And there was something to balance the ledger this time, for now a message had gone out. Now the government would not ignore the people any longer, nor plead ignorance of the charges who had once who had been placed in its care by the white man's law. The message had gone out. The response to it had been too slow and badly bungled, but at least there had been a response. And at long last the government acknowledged that in the Great Plains there lived the people who were its wards. Fifty years of darkness had intervened between the time of Tyrell's visit and this belated recognition of the people he had found. Now half a century of casual forgetfulness was at an end, and for the second time in their long history, at, as squatters in this land of ours, the existence of the helmet was admitted. And surely this was a bright victory for the conscience of our race, not dimmed or clouded because that victory came too late to do more than prolong the last dying spasms of the people of the little hills.